live to the conservative debate getting underway right now. Candidate to be the next leader of our party. Again, each candidate will have three minutes to answer this question. We'll start with Scott Aitchison, three minutes. Great. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. Uh, the first thing I would say is that it's been an immense honor and a privilege to travel this country and meet Canadians from coast to coast. There's a lot more that unites us than the partisan bickering that goes on in Ottawa might suggest. But the single biggest thing that I hear Canadians tell me everywhere in this country is that they're actually looking for a government that simply des delivers results. They're tired of the photo ops, they're tired of this, the, the talk, but no real action on a wide range of issues. So how do we conservatives show that we're ready to lead? We have to show them a real plan, a real principled conservative plan. At my core, I'm a small town mayor and I've had to work hard all my career from municipal council up to mayor up to today to earn the trust of the people I serve. My campaign for the leadership of the Conservative Party has been about ideas, offering real solutions to the problems that Canadians face every day. And I believe we need to focus on three priorities. Making life more affordable, keeping Canada strong and free, and also defending Canadian values. You know, to make life more affordable, we must start by ending the housing crisis. And that's why I talk about implementing my YIMBY plan to get more homes built. We need to lower grocery bills. We need to end supply management. And in the process, we will also get government out of the way and help our farmers sell their products around the world. I'll also end the carbon tax. You know, only a liberal plan would take your money, hire a bureaucracy to manage it, mail some of it back to you, then ask you to thank them for it. You know, that's not fighting climate change. That's a shell game trying to cover up a tax scheme, another liberal tax and spend program. And speaking of taxes, they should be simple, predictable, fair, and lower. And so that's my plan to fix Canada's broken tax code to simplify it. And we need to keep Canada strong and free. We must once again be reliable partners on the world stage. That means investing in our armed forces and meeting our 2% NATO target. It means supporting countries like Taiwan and Israel who face threats to their democracy every single day. And at home, we need to stop attacking legal gun owners and instead focus on, the, on stopping the flow of illegal firearms heading into our country. You know, we have to be frank. To to, to, to get this election done, to win the next election, to replace Justin Trudeau, we cannot do it unless we're united as a party. And so no matter what happens on September the 10th, we conservatives need to come together and offer Canadians a principled conservative message that will retire Justin Trudeau and get this country turned around. You can read more about it in my website at votescott.ca. I want to thank you for tuning in and sharing a few moments with you. I'm looking forward to answering more questions. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. We'll now go to Jean Charest, three minutes. Thank you very much, Rob. And, and I want to start by saying that I'm delighted to be here. And I've accepted every invitation for debates or panels. And I actually thought when this leadership race started that the, this is fundamental to our responsibility towards the members of the party, to be accountable to them, to answer their questions, to participate in a, in a debate. For a candidate in a leadership race not to participate in the debate is like a fish who says he doesn't want to swim in the ocean. I mean, this is the basic thing that we all need to do and, and should be accountable for. And I, I, I want to commend both Roman and Scott for being here. And Scott, there's a lot of what you've just said that I, I agree with, and in particular about uniting the party. Because at the end of the day, if we are not united as a party, it's pretty simple. We're not going to be getting the confidence of Canadians. Rob, you talked about the mood of the country, and the mood of the country isn't very good. Our country is more divided today than it has been uh, since I've been involved in public life. And it isn't just east-west, it's intergenerational, it's between urban and rural Canadians, it's uh, also between new Canadians and uh, who, who now live in a period where they just feel that the federal government is not doing their job. In fact, I've never seen it so bad. The government of Mr. Trudeau can't run a passport office, the airports are a mess, the immigration department is a mess. I mean, there's nothing that's getting done. And yet we pay taxes for all of this, and you'd think that they would have their act together. And there's an urgency to change governments. Canadians want change, and they're looking to us as conservatives as the alternative. And that's what this race is about, to offer an alternative. I've done exactly that. 
with policies on defense, policies on environment and, and resources, policies on daycare, policies that speak to the fundamental issues that our families are facing in this country, affordability, housing, all these things that count for every one of us. But conservatives, if there's one thing I want to say to conservatives that I've heard from every one of you is that you have had enough of losing. We lost in 15, 19, 21. And it isn't so much that we lose that we lose the campaign, well, the, that the Liberals win. We give it away to them. We have to be the most generous party in the world. Well, if we've had enough of losing, if there's one thing that is now clear in the race at the moment that I am speaking to you now, is that I can win a majority government. And that's what we need. None of the good ideas that Scott has, Roman has, that I will propose in this leadership race, will actually mean anything unless we gain the confidence of Canadians in urban areas, in Ontario, in Quebec, in Alberta, and that we work out of the base that we have in Western Canada. In this race, there is one choice. If we want to form government, I ask you to support my leadership. Thank That's you. what this candidate campaign is all about. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Charest. Uh, we don't have any sad trombones in this debate, so I'll ask uh, all of you to indulge me as I keep the uh, order going. Although I did uh, do some trombone in junior high, but no, no sad trombones here. And we'll turn the floor now over to uh, Mr. Babber. You have three minutes. Thank you, Rob. Rob, I'm a friendly guy, and over the last few months, I've spoken to thousands of Canadians. Canadians tell me that they're tired of the incompetence of this Liberal government. I practiced law for 12 years before I was elected, and I helped build a small business. So I'm going to bring my private sector skills to create a culture of professionalism and accountability in the federal government. Many Canadians tell me that they're giving up on Canada, and then they want to go on their own. I'll extend a hand of friendship to every Canadian in every province to heal our divisions. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live, you'll have a friend and someone who'll listen to you in the federal government. And I promise you, many Canadians are telling me that they're not feeling well. That's probably the most important issue that's facing us today. A mental health catastrophe is gripping our nation. Most of us have COVID and 85% of us are vaccinated. We need to end, and I will end this public health exercise and going forward, let Canadians make their own choices together with their doctors. We need relief and we need to move on so we can all heal. I hear from many Canadians how hurt they are by 21st century segregation, how personal choice and basic security of a person were violated. Many Canadians lost their jobs, denied mobility, access to loved ones in a hospital. I was the only conservative fighting this evil before it was cool. I brought a bill in Ontario to stand up for jobs a year ago. I will ban this discrimination and freeze funding to any province that still allows it. People are people. I learned that in law school when I worked at a community legal aid clinic, you have to respect people's choices and people's dignity. Canadians are scared of censorship and government. We're censored in the media, online, by regulators, at work. I lived the first nine years of my life under a communist regime. My family feared the KGB and taught me not to talk about politics or disclose that we had a prayer book. I got the gift of freedom, and I know how precious and fragile our democracy is. We're free. We're free Canadian, and we have the right to be wrong. Speech is the holy grail of all rights, because through speech, we defend all other rights. I'll repeal all of the censorship bills. I'll defend professionals. There is no free speech without free and independent media. I'll free social media, defend the CBC, and end all subsidies and bailouts to the media. I will never silence Canadians, political opponents, or members of parliament. Finally, Canadians are losing trust in government, but not with me. I got kicked out of the Conservative caucus in Ontario for opposing the lockdowns. I lost my Justice Committee chair, and my loved ones have been put through very hard times. But I fought like hell, every way I knew how, because that's what Canadians expect from us, for our democracy and for our children. I'm always going to say what I believe and do what I believe is right, even when it's unpopular. And that's a principle I'll return to the Conservative Party. Canadians are counting on us. I'd be very humbled to lead our party and our country. Thank you, Mr. Babber. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll turn now to our next question. Each of you will get 90 seconds to respond. Last week, Pope Francis visited Alberta, Quebec, and Nunavut to apologize to Indigenous people for the horrors of residential schools. As our next Conservative Prime Minister, how will you succeed in restoring trust, respect, and economic opportunity 
with Indigenous peoples. We'll start with Jean Charest. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. This is one of the sad legacies of Mr. Trudeau. He created an incredible expectations about reconciliation. But let's just dwell a moment on one example. He said he would fix the problem of portable, potable drinking water in First Nations Indigenous communities. And it isn't done. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, after all seven years, you think this can't be done? I guarantee you one thing. I'm Prime Minister of this country. It will be done. We will do what we have to do to fix this. It is inadmissible that Canada would accept this. And for indigenous, indigenous Canadians, what we need is to help them develop their leadership and their economic base for their communities. One of the things I want to do is a federal Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. I'm stealing a book out of what Alberta did, so that we offer Indigenous leaders and communities the opportunity to participate in their economic development, not just by receiving royalties or passing on their land, but actually owning equity in projects. That is the kind of change that will be consequential and real for Indigenous Canadians. Same thing for housing. In this leadership race, housing is a big issue. Scott's just raised it. I think Indigenous Canadians should have a program run by them for Indigenous Canadians. That's the kind of real-time leadership that the country needs. Thank you, Mr. Shara. We'll move now to Roman Baber. One minute, 30 seconds. Thank you. I think we have to be honest and learn from our history so we don't repeat it. But dividing Canadians like Justin Trudeau does actually hurts reconciliation. The best thing we can do for reconciliation is to improve the lives of Indigenous peoples. We still have hundreds of communities in Canada that don't have clean water. And we've been talking about this for 20 years. We can make water out of air now. There are no more excuses. I'm going to get water done by the end of my first term. But there is no improving lives without safety and dignity. Many reserves are experiencing lawlessness and violence. We must protect Indigenous people and especially Indigenous women. We must stop pretending that this isn't happening. We must defend all Canadians, and that means instructing law enforcement to defend Canadians who live on reserves. And generally, let's stop being afraid and start rethinking life on the reserve. Imagine not owning your own property. Imagine being told by a chief that you no longer live in your home and that someone else is now going to occupy your home. I'm not going to pay lip service and I'm not going to play pretend. I'm going to work with a new generation of Indigenous leaders and Indigenous business leaders to improve the lives and safety of Indigenous Canadians. Home ownership improves communities and the quality of life. Let's get it done. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We'll now go to Scott Aitchison. Thanks. One minute, 30 seconds. Thanks, Rob. I, I, I would say that this has really been the most important theme of my campaign, is one of respect. And this, I would say, is where our institutions have most failed um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And you think about the question, relationship. It hasn't been a relationship for generations in this country. It's been a top-down, patriarchal kind of approach. Uh, and in some cases, early on, it was about you know, erasing Indigenous First Nations culture. And so I, I look at what's has, what has gone on, and, and Jean spoke a little bit about this. You know, in the last six years, the Liberals have completed 12 of the 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. 12. In 2020, they completed a grand total of zero. And in 2021, when hundreds of unmarked graves were discovered at residential schools, the Liberals completed three within the span of a, a month. So why did it take such a horrible discovery for the Liberals to take action? It's because they don't take action. They're about photo ops and talk and not action. And so as Conservative leader and as Prime Minister, I would start from a position of a real relationship, which is about respect. We know what First Nations people want and what they frankly deserve from what we learned in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. We need to make sure that that relationship is real and we improve the lives of First Nations people everywhere. And as Conservative Party leader, I will get it done. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Thank you, candidates. For the next two questions, as a reminder, after our Q&A round for each question, we'll have a four-minute open discussion period. As moderator, I reserve the right to intervene as appropriate during the four minutes to ensure each candidate is given comparable time to speak. Now on to our question. It's harder than ever to travel across Canada. 
Inner city bus service has disappeared in many parts of the country. Passenger rail is so inadequate that Canada's environment minister was forced to abandon his cross-Canada climate change rail tour. Pearson Airport's a mess, and our major air carriers have reduced service in the peak summer season. As the next Prime Minister, how will you get Canadians moving again? And we'll start with Roman Baber, sir. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. There's a very important issue regarding mobility of Canadians that I'd like to address first. It's unthinkable that we still force 15% of Canadians to detain themselves under threat of jail every time they enter and exit Canada. Mobility rights are not just charter rights, they're human rights. The passports do not prevent the spread of COVID and we need to end the shameful episode in our nation's history. And no new normal in mobility. Public Safety Minister Michael, uh, Marco Mendocino said that the federal government now sees a use for the ArriveCan app beyond the pandemic. This is exactly what many of us have feared. The tools that were created, that were developed to keep Canadians safe from COVID will remain post the pandemic and will form a new surveillance state. I will not allow Canada to turn into a surveillance state. A free and democratic society does not hinder entry and exit of its citizens. Next. I'm in favor of massive transit in the GTA. I represented a North Toronto riding, and we should not be afraid to talk about issues that are important to folks in the GTA. It's good for the economy, it's good on our balance sheet, it's easy to finance and will spur economic growth, and it's good for housing. And the best thing we can do for housing is build more roads. Building roads encourages the construction of new and affordable communities. I'm going to start building roads again in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We'll move now to Scott Aitchison. One minute, 30 seconds. The floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Rob. Well, I, th there's no question that we've all heard the horror stories at, you know, Pearson Airport where things are a disaster, where our airlines, uh, whether it's, you know, passport lines that people can't get a passport in this country because, again, the Liberals just can't get the job done. Whether it's Nexus lines where, you know, Canadians, you know, pay huge fees for air travel and rail travel and it's not really a great service to begin with. But I, I think what matters even more than this issue, frankly, and, uh, and I, I, like, I really think it's the most important issue that Canadians face today, is, is social mobility, and upward social mobility. And I'm pivoting back to, to the importance of housing, because there are an awful lot of Canadians in this country who can't even dream of the idea of taking a flight somewhere, because they don't have a warm bed to sleep in at night. And to me, that's the, that's the, that is the great crime, that this government, this liberal government, has promised billions and billions of dollars over the last seven years, and the situation has gotten worse. The, C the CMHC has told us the situation is actually worse. And so I've said many times, if promising billions of dollars could solve the problem, we'd have a housing surplus in this country, and we don't. And so while it's important to clean up the mess and actually get services working for Canadians so they can travel again, and we can move around this country, the most important issue facing us, frankly, is making sure that every Canadian has a warm, safe bed to sleep in at night, and I will get that done. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Jean Charest, you now have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. You know, transport is one of the key drivers of our economy. And it is about the simple idea of moving from one place to the other, but it's about productivity, it's about an economy that works, it's about the ability of Canadians to actually get to their place of work and get back home and do it efficiently. We live in a federal system of government. There is a role, and if, we, if we're going to get this job done, it requires that we have a Prime Minister who under, actually understands how this country of ours works. The provinces have their responsibilities and the municipalities have their responsibilities. As Prime Minister, one of the first things I would do is within the six months after being elected is convene a federal provincial meeting with the Premiers, the Council of the Federation. This would be one of the items on the agenda. How do we actually sit down together, because we can't do it otherwise, to make sure that we have the kind of infrastructure we need to be able to move people around, whether it's buses or trains or it's ports or airports. On airports, yeah, it's sad. It's, all of us are traveling these days. I mean, it has become, uh, you know, a, a nightmare. Who would have thought Mr. Trudeau wanted us to be one of the best countries in the world, that we'd rank among the best? Well, we actually rank among the highest in the world for the worst airports. Pearson Airport. And airports, Rob, is the entry point of any given country. Who would have thought we'd be a country that you can visit for a week and leave your butt luggage here for two weeks? 
I don't, I don't think that's exactly what we want. Thank and I, I can guarantee you I'll do better. Thank you, Mr. Shadai. We'll move now to our four minutes of open discussion, and I'll invite Robin Babber to get us started. Mr. Babber. Thank you. Look, if we learned anything from the Rogers outage a couple of weeks ago is the terrible state of our federally regulated industries. We have a complete mess because we have three phone companies, two airlines, and five banks. There's absolutely no reason to continue to defend this antiquated regime or any of those antiquated institutions. No, we need more competition to get, their, uh, to get them off their backs and working again. So I propose that we allow for more competition, and that includes competition in airlines. British Airways lands in Toronto on its way to Vancouver. There's no reason why I can't hop on it and, and pay less. So I propose to remove barriers to entry and encourage competition. Attract new players, no more protectionism. It'll be good for the economy, it'll be good for jobs, it'll be good for the consumer and good for prices. I'm going to free these federally regulated industries and get Canadians moving again. Mr. Atchison, your thoughts? Yeah, I, and I would completely agree with what Roman has said. We do need more competition. Uh, it's amazing to me in this country how much we have traded away for exceptional service or some sort of nationalism around, you know, our own airlines and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, uh, the bigger issue for me for the airlines and for the airports, frankly, uh, is, that, is that in a lot of other countries, they see airports as economic development tools and drivers. Here in Canada, we see them as cash cows. So the Ministry of Transportation just charges them huge rents. Uh, and, and, and that's crippling the airports. And, and we should see them as, as massive economic development drivers not just for tourism, but, 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 but for trade around the world. We're a trading nation, and, and these are the, the, the major ports that we get goods in and out of this country. And so we, we should see them as economic development tools, not as cash cows. And, and frankly, we need to create a culture of accountability in these government agencies. That's the problem in Ottawa in general, is that there's, there's not a culture of accountability and results. And that's what a Conservative government led by me would deliver. Mr. Shutta. Something's terribly wrong in this country, uh, Rob. It's passports, airports, uh, Department of Immigration. The government's not working. It's not delivering services. By the way, when you go to the airport and you buy a ticket and to travel somewhere, you actually pay fees. You, as a citizen, you pay for the services that you're supposed to get at the airport. This isn't, it doesn't happen for free. And you're not getting those services. So the, this, the next federal government has to get serious about and give real direction to how airports should be administered with accountability, with benchmarks on service that you receive. For example, on ArriveCan, ArriveCan we should do away with the first day that we form the government. There's enough bureaucracy at the airport. We don't need to layer it on. So these are things that we should do. I'm also a big believer, Rob, in, in, the, uh, in, in using the train service. I think one of the lost opportunities in this country for years has been our, an opportunity for us to develop a rail service across the country that's much more efficient, of faster trains. We could actually connect to the United States, do things with them that would allow us to change the cities of Canada, change the way that we travel. But for that to happen, we need a, a federal government that has a vision and gets serious about this. Okay, Mr. Shadar, we got 40 seconds. Uh, Mr. Babber, or Mr. Aitchison, uh, either you want to dive in? I think a lot of this, I think a lot of what's happening right now at the airports, at the passport office, is a self-inflicted wound. We know that this government is so determined, it's so intent to pursue misguided COVID ideological response that is no longer based in science. It creates friction at our airports, at our passport offices, in our healthcare, and everything, and everywhere else. We need to end and go back to normal. It will immediately give us relief. Let's give Mr. Aitchison a few seconds there. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a classic situation. We have a liberal government that believes that the government should be and all, do and be all things to all people. It's simply not the case. Conservatives know that if you introduce competition, you can actually improve services. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Great discussion, candidates. We'll move now to our next question. Conservative Party members oppose a carbon tax, but Conservatives are also committed to action on climate change. Both statements are included in the party's policy declaration, and groups like Conservatives for Clean Growth are calling for a stable, credible, long-term net zero climate plan. My question is, can we have a net zero climate plan while maintaining the party's opposition to a carbon tax? Scott Aitchison, the floor is yours for the next one minute 30 seconds. And the simple answer to that question, Rob, is yes, we can. 
You know, for seven years, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals have missed every single climate target they've set. And what's worse, they've just sought to divide Canadians by attacking our energy sector. We are a resource superpower of this country. And all they've done is attack our resources. Conservatives will do better. We can do better. My, my plan to fight climate change and protect the environment will actually get the job done. If I become Conservative leader and Prime Minister, here's what we'll do. We will have an infrastructure resilience plan to help Canadians deal and adapt with the extreme weather events. Climate change is here, and we need to invest before disaster strikes, not after. We will lower industrial emissions by making the biggest polluters pay. We will phase out coal and intensify, densify our cities and invest in technology, not taxes. We will focus on nuclear power, carbon, 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 carbon capture technology. We'll get the job done. Canadians need to see this as an opportunity. If Canada was wiped away from the face of the earth tomorrow, it would have a negligible impact on climate change and, and the carbon output on the planet. So we need to do our bit, but also make sure that we are selling this innovative and entrepreneurial technology to the world to help the rest of the world reduce their footprint as well. We have the tools. We have the skill set. We have the know-how. Let's, let's sell it to the world. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. We'll turn now to Jean Charest. One minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. One of the keys to us forming a national government is having a credible plan on the environment, resources, and climate. If we don't have that, we will not be elected, period. And uh, by the way, a slogan is not a climate plan. And you can't tax your way into reducing carbon emissions. That is not a plan either. I would do away with Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax on consumers because it hurts rural Canadians, it hurts small and medium-sized businesses. What I would do is a comprehensive approach, and it includes carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, whether blue or green, biofuels, small modular reactors. These are all the areas in which Canada can develop expertise. There's four provinces working together on small modular reactors. That includes Saskatchewan, Alberta, Ontario, and New Brunswick. We can lead the world in this, and if we do it, we'd actually assist the oil patch by allowing them to have a different source of energy than natural gas to be able to draw the bitumen and the oil that we should sell around the world as a reliable and ethical supplier. The world in Ukraine has reminded us that had we assumed our responsibilities, had we been wiser and had a prime minister who had some leadership, that we would actually be able to go out there and supply energy to Europe instead of watching Europeans finance Russia to invade Ukraine. We can do this and have a levy on big Thank you, Mr. producers. That's the Thank approach you, Mr. that Canada needs. You'll have some time during the open discussion. Uh, we'll move now to Roman Baber. One minute, 30 seconds. I'm going to take a different approach, Rob. Uh, I was not afraid to take on, on the radical COVID mob, and I will not be afraid to take on the radical left-wing environmental mob. We should not, as conservatives, be afraid uh, about talking about the environment. We know that Canada produces less than 1.5% of all global emissions, and there is no certainty that even if you were to cut all of those emissions, that that would make a material difference in the climate. We know who the polluters are. They're in China. They're in Russia. They're in India. And the Paris Accord does not hold them anywhere near to the same standard as Canada is held to. So I'm going to reframe this conversation. Canada is blessed with so much forest that much of our greenhouse gases are actually naturally absorbed. And we don't get credit for that under the Paris Accord. And I do not believe that taxing Sally $10 at the gas pump every time she fills up her car is actually going to affect the global climate. I don't think that many people actually believe that anymore. And I think that many Canadians agree with me on this topic. So I will not impose a regressive tax that only serves to punish Canadians. However, I would like to look at planting more trees. Right now, we're planting about 360 million trees a year. I would look to increase that to half a billion a year. I love trees. I love Canadian forest. Let's try to capture most of our emissions naturally. Thank you, Mr. Barber. We'll open up our four minutes of uh, discussion and ask uh, Scott Aitchison to get us started. Mr. Thanks, Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. And I, uh, I, I guess I'd like to challenge my, uh, my colleagues a little bit here. We're very friendly. We all get along. But I think it's important to, to challenge. And I, and I appreciate where Roman comes from on this issue and what, what, what you said, Roman. But 
At the same time, you know, my comments about you know marketing technologies to the rest of the world to help them reduce their footprint is important as well. And I and I think it's important that you know why don't you acknowledge that that we can see this as an opportunity for businesses and entrepreneurs in Canada. And I want to challenge Jean as well because Jean, you talked about the importance of having a climate change plan and a policy that we, if we don't have that, we will not actually be elected as the next government. But unity is also really important as well within our party. And so I, I want to challenge you, Jean, because there's been a lot of talk about what happens after this. If, if I don't win or you don't win or you don't win, what happens? We have to come together as a party after this is over, whoever the leader is, and work together. Will you be part of that? Will you continue to work together as a conservative with the team, whoever the leader is, and help bring the party together? But, Scott, would, do you disagree with me that this is a key issue for us being elected? Absolutely it is. It is? Okay. Well, then we agree on that. We agree. We need a credible plan. And by the way, conservatives should, uh, you know, take some credit for our history in dealing with these issues. Rob, we actually gave birth to the most credible, the most effective uh, environmental treaty in the world, the Montreal Protocol on reducing CFCs and HCFCs, which, by the way, contains economic instruments. We're the government that actually did the Clean Air Act of the United States to reduce SO2 emissions. That also includes uh, e economic mechanisms. So my proposal is taking a book out of the page of what Alberta does with a levy on large emitters, which are the most effective ones to be able to deal with this. And by the way, this is what the oil patch agrees with so that we are able to reach zero emissions by 2050 and do it in a smart way. And we should, you know, look at what Europe's doing. After Glasgow, Europe has actually proposed a transitional period that includes natural gas and nuclear. Well, Canada needs to be smart about this, and we can be smart about it. And if you know, if you follow what's being done in Alberta, the positions taken in the energy industry, they actually agree with this approach. This is the smart approach that will get the job done, and you know what? will also gain the support of Canadians and elect a national conservative government. Thank you, Mr. Shaddai. Mr. Baber. Thank you, Rob. Look, Scott, of course I'm in favor of, of new and, and advanced technologies. I just want to make sure that the taxpayer is not held holding the bag. We've seen that happening in Ontario with the former Kathleen Wynne and previously the McGinty government that would finance all sorts of green technologies. Uh, for instance, there were a lot of solar panels that were costing us about 70 cents a kilowatt of, of hydro. Uh, but the market rate was about seven cents. And so Ontarians were held uh, holding the difference and, and paying the difference. And that's what created this, this remarkable uh, green energy debt that Ontarians are now settled with. Second of all, what I'm against is imposing on Canadians a way of life that they do not want to live. And I do not believe that Canadians should be made to, to drive less or to farm less, especially farm less. We have a global insecurity in food. We have a global food shortage. And, and you know, there's a lot of joking going around with a plant outside of London, Ontario, and, and four million crickets, and, and I'm not eating crickets. I think that we should be able to farm not less, we should farm more. And we should also, in order for us to get out of the economic mess that we're in, we need to turn Canada into natural resources superpower that we ought to be instead of hindering our manufacturing of natural resources. Well, do I look like a guy who eats seconds. crickets? You know? <laughs> I do want to say I would do away with the Trudeau uh, carbon tax on consumers and also repeal BC48 and C69. These thank, two very important uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shara. And I don't think there are any crickets at home, whether eating or people watching. Very good discussion uh, amongst our three candidates. To wrap up our English language section of the debate, I'm now going to ask each of the three participating candidates to share any additional comments they wish members to hear before we move to the French language section of the debate. Each of you will get two minutes and we'll begin with Scott Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. You know, our answer to Justin Trudeau's divisive politics cannot be more division. We must lead with respect. We have to offer real solutions to the challenges Canadians face every day and, and produce a government that actually delivers results. We can't be the party that just rails against government. We have to be the party that offers better government, that actually respects taxpayer dollars and delivers results. We also have to come together as conservatives. I would point out in the last little discussion there that Roman answered my question, but Jean did not, about what happens after this leadership race. We have to come together. Whoever the leader of the party is on September the 11th, 
Every one of us must come together. And I challenge every candidate in this race to stand up and say that they will come together. They will work with the conservative movement, whoever the leader is, work with our team in Ottawa to make sure that we are united, that we are presenting a conservative, principled conservative, consistent message, and that we defeat Justin Trudeau in the next election. We simply cannot do it unless we are united. Canadians are frustrated. They are looking for an alternative. They don't, Justin Trudeau didn't win the last election. We lost it. We have to do better. Canadians deserve better government. Canadians deserve better from us. And so I encourage you, look at my plan. I talk about real solutions that actually present solutions to the problems that Canadians face every single day. Not just taglines, not just talk, not just Justin Trudeau style photo ops, but real solutions. Check out votescott.ca. You can read all about it there, and no matter what happens on September the 10th, I commit that as Conservatives, I will work as a member of the team, as a member of Parliament, I will work with our team to bring our caucus together, to bring our movement together, and to make sure that we defeat Justin Trudeau in the next election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Roman Baber, you now have two minutes. Thank you, Rob. Um, my dear Canadians, I'm optimistic because the media is turning on Justin Trudeau. And many of his ministers are now on the ropes, and Canadians are tired of uh, this unscientific COVID response and the divisive tone that the Prime Minister insists on. I personally cannot wait for the next general election. I never wanted to win an election this badly because, frankly, our country is at stake. And I hear all this talk uh, about division in our party and, and people that are not on the leadership ballot talking about alternatives. It saddens me immensely. So. I want you to imagine a scenario. It's the day after the election and you wake up and Justin Trudeau is re-elected Prime Minister. Or even worse, Christia Freeland is Prime Minister now. Not good, right? Well, we're counting on each other to make sure that this does not happen. And that means that we must stick together for the sake of our nation. We all need to take a step back, take a deep breath, simmer down. Our party is almost 700,000 members strong. It's a credit to every leadership contestant in this race. On September 10th, I will stretch out all five, eight and a half inches of me to embrace and unite this party, regardless of who wins. And I'm counting on each one of my friends to come along and do the same. And I also want to ask you to rank me first. There is no vote splitting as long as you mark another candidate second. If I don't win, then once I fall off the ballot, your vote will go to your second choice. You will still get the result that you like. But no, it doesn't work the other way around. If you mark me second, I may not get your vote if your first cho unless your first choice finishes last. So please mark me first to reject the COVID policies of the last two years. Please mark me first to send a message to the Conservative Party that it must stand on principle even when it's difficult. And mark me first to have a strong democratic movement Thank you, Mr. within Bauer. our party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baber. Jean Charest, you now have two minutes. Roman Baber, Scott Aitchison, and I all agree on one thing. If we are going to unite the party, you have to show up. You actually have to show up. You have to speak to the membership. You can't treat them with contempt. At this point in the leadership race, about close, what, maybe 25% of members have voted, 75% of you have not yet cast your ballot. This is the moment where you are the one who should be holding us accountable on what it is that we're proposing in terms of leadership. I've led caucuses, federally. I've done it in a province, and I've done it successfully. I have a track record of uniting. And this party, if there's one thing this party has to sort out, more than anything else, because we paid a high price for it in 19 and 21, a very high price, and now the country's paying a high price for it, is getting our country, our party organized and united. I will do that. I know how to do it. It's what I've done all my life. And if we are able to do that, well, then that's the first condition to uniting the, part, the country. This country is crying out for our leadership. There is a boulevard out there of Canadians who want a fiscally conservative government who's going to have a real economic 
plan for the country and also understands that we can't get big projects done. We can't get pipelines done. We can't get energy projects done unless there's a national government. And it would be a breath of fresh air, ladies and gentlemen, to actually have a prime minister in Canada who lives outside of the Ottawa bubble, whether it's the media or it's the political parties or the bureaucracy, and actually understands how this country works, respects the provinces, respects his own party members, and is able to make this country work to the benefit of all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Sharad. This brings to a close the English language section of the debate. Although candidates will be free to give their closing statements in the official language of their choice after the French language section of the debate. Uh, Mesdames et Messieurs, après cette courte pause de 30 secondes, nous allons débuter le débat. We will start the debate in French. Thank you.